Welcome everyone to Paranormal Roundtable. I'm your host, Josh Turner, and with me is Tony Misha. and Ev- okay. and Anthony, and we have a show for you tonight. But first, let me get to the coordinates here. Josh Turner at PRTPodcast.com. Josh Turner at PRTPodcast.com. That's how you can get in touch with me. Anthony, you want to tell them about the uh, Patreon? The Patreon is patreon.com slash PRT podcast. And of course, g- there's going to be a link to that down in the description below on YouTube. And we have four tiers, 10 through $40. Well, actually, we have five tiers, 10 through uh, $50 tiers, uh, the $10 tier. After three months, you'll receive a swag bag in the mail with all kinds of PRT merch and, and uh, goodies. And, and if you want to skip that three month waiting period, you can sign up for any of the higher tiers and you'll get your swag bag immediately. The higher tier you sign up for, the more you're going to get in your swag bag. Regardless of what tier you sign up for, you're going to get more than your money's worth. Yeah, each tier gives you an, a, a little bit more oomph. Yeah. Uh, the $40 tier gets you one of my signed books along with another book from a different author. And then if you sign up for the $50 tier, you're going to get both of my autographed books along with an autographed book from one of many other authors, authors like... Um, Chad Lewis, David Weatherly, King Gerhard, La Blackburn, Nick Redfern, the list goes on and on. Uh, so, yeah, that that is our guarantee to you. Um, you get a variety of shirts, hats, all kinds of stuff. Um, $10 tier, you get a hat. Uh, $20 tier, you get a book, or you get a, a shirt. Um, $30 tier, you get a hat. Uh, what is it? You get a hat, a shirt, and a book. And then, and then it was, you get two books, $4 tier. Yep. Something like that. I mean, I got to go back and look. It's just how you it's, get better and better. You get you gets a bunch of stuff. You get we give you stickers, we give you keychains, we give you all kinds of stuff. A Chris high five. I mean, you get it a all. Chris high five. Yeah. <laughs> but you have to you have to just go and ask your mom or dad for that high five, and just you know what? It, it's I'll give that to them, and they can give it to you. Mm-hmm. Okay? Yeah, but remember to send us a message whenever you sign up for Patreon. Send that message on Patreon. Uh, just let us know what tier you signed up for, and then we're gonna need your mailing address and your shirt size. Yep. And when it gets a little colder, you might get a beanie or a, a hoodie. hoodie. Yep. But right now, it's hot as the, the surface of the sun. So mm-hmm. our grass um, is dying. <laughs> <laughs> sure is. And HOA is all about that. Hey, your, your grass is dying. You better make it live. We're going to get you, boo. It's like Boss Hog and Roscoe Pico train <laughs> running the HOA over there, dude. You know, mm-hmm. your, your car's two centimeters off the blue side of the driveway. Boo, boo, boo. Man, our HOA sucks, dude. Let me tell you something, though, folks. I'm going to give you some advice, okay? I'm going to tell you this right now, and I'm not joking. I'm not playing around. You got to get to the conference. The conference is coming up um, in just in just a few days. We're going to be at the conference. We're not going to have any shows that weekend, obviously, because Friday is the VIP dinner. Uh, Saturday and Sunday we'll be doing the, and then Monday we'll be coming back and t- Tuesday we'll be too tired for the, so mm-hmm. th- there won't be any shows for a few days, but it was all going to be at the conference, but we're working on a way to stream it. So if you haven't bought tickets and you don't think you're going to be able to make it to the conference, we are going to have it streamed hopefully. So as of this recording, we're already working, um, which is a, a good week in advance, but we're working on getting it streamed for you because those people by popular demand want to stream it. Um, and it's going to be, we're going to get it done. We'll get it done. Don't worry. So here's what we're going to do folks tonight. We're going to talk about uh, it's, this is a paranormal potluck, which we do periodically. People love the paranormal potluck and we're going to talk about some r- really crazy, weird stories. But before we do that, Josh Turner, nine forty on Instagram, please go and, Find me. I am on Instagram, Josh Turner nine forty Mushu. You're on there too. PRT Mushu. Uh, you can find me on there. I post stuff about the show, and uh, also if you can't find anything, or if you're trying to find it later on during the show, and you want to find any of our uh, stuff we mentioned earlier, you can just go into the YouTube description. And you'll find everything we have posted right there to make it easier for y'all. Yeah, and and another thing I was going to tell you too, if if you want to be a friend of mine on Instagram or Facebook, let me know that you are a listener of the show so I can approve you. And if you do that, then I'll approve you. If you have stories, Josh Turner at PRTPodcast.com, send them to that, or you can send them to my messenger or to my Instagram, either way. I have two different emails and I have a bunch of different, you know, some people still use my old email, that's fine. Um, It still works, send it to me. I got bunches and bunches of stories. 
Uh, but if your story is compelling, then I may be able to put it on the show. Or if you really want to just tell it yourself, that's fine too. And if you're able to do that, then we'll put you on the show. I have a guest every Friday on the live stream on YouTube. If you're not watching, you're missing out. Sunday, we just do what we do here, but just longer. We do a two or three hour show of nothing but stories. So with that being said, let's get started with this podcast episode, uh, this paranormal potluck. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you. I go through my email and I found some really good ones that, 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 you know, bunch of different ones. And I, I'm, I'm almost torn between which one I like the most to start with. But I'll start with the Dogman one because the conference is coming up. So why not start with that one? Now, I, I call this one Werewolf in the Junkyard because that's what it was. It, it, this is really weird. This is a weird story. And I'll say these stories are all weird. I get that. But this actually happened to a friend of a friend. Like I, I met this person once at the club years ago. He's an acquaintance and, um, he goes by the nickname of Bubba and Bubba, Bubba actually doesn't live in Houston. He lives outside of Houston. And uh, a friend of mine that's originally from Beaumont, who was a, tr- a uh, tow truck driver who I knew from the club for years and years told me, he says, you know, I found your your show through a mutual friend of ours, and he says, hey, you got to go check out Wolf. He's got a show. They all call me Wolf. They don't call me Josh Turner. And he says that Bubba had a crazy encounter with something that you would probably want to hear. I barely met this guy one time, and we were having a few uh, drinks at, at a little after party uh, probably 15 years ago in Houston, in the east, far east side of Houston. Uh, very nice guy, good friend of my my one of my friends who I consider like a brother. And so he says, come on down, you know, because we were there to see the Astros play. I've been a lifelong Astros fan. And so I said, yeah, well, let's go. Let's go. Uh, we'll, we'll meet you. We'll check it out, whatever. At that time, I didn't know much about this guy other than he was a very colorful character. And I just recently found out that he actually had a dogman encounter. And so when we started talking, I told him, I said, Bubba, why didn't you tell me about this? He goes, you never asked. He's like... <laughs> And I didn't know you were into these things. He's like, to me, it was just one of the weirdest things that ever happened to me. Um, And he goes, and I listened to your show. And now he's got the book and he's read the book. And he told me, he's like, dude, I couldn't believe what I was reading. I couldn't believe that you had this experience. And I said, well, I couldn't believe that you had one too. And you never told me about it. I asked him, I said, "So, so what happened? He said, well, me and my son, Jake, and my brother-in-law, we repoed a car and we took it back to this tow yard and it, and, and it was a really nice car and he's, he works kind of for, two, well, he works for two different tow companies or he was working for two different tow companies and they have this policy there where if somebody doesn't actually pick up the car, you know, then they send it to auction, but he's really good friends with these people that own this tow yard. And so he told him, he said, this is a nice car, you know, it was repoed. And he said that if there's anything, you know, that I could do to get a leg up on the auction or whatever, you know, sometimes they won't even send them to auction. If somebody w- wants to buy them, they'll just sell it to them after the, the time is up. So they said that there wasn't any keys. So that's kind of a hassle. You got to get recalibrated and all that. So he, he knows a lot of people. He's a very resourceful guy, um, like myself, you know. And, and so what he did was he, he waited until the time expired. Nobody ever came to pick up the car or try to get it, whatever. And he went back up there and he inquired about it and he said, hey, you know, can I purchase this vehicle, whatever. And the owner of the, of the tow yard was like, sure. So he, he bought the car. Well, once he got it recalibrated and he got the locks and all that, you know, he figured out th- that this thing needed a part. And I can't remember exactly what part it was, but uh, it was an essential part to the vehicle. And, and, you know, he told me, he's like, I had to go to a junkyard to go and find it. Um, I think it was a starter or something like that, but it was something else too. There was like a starter and then something else he needed. Um, and, and so he went to a junkyard that was owned by a friend of theirs in Southeast Houston. Uh, now this was back in 2012, I believe. And so he, he went there and, and they did not expect to have happen what happened to them. Nobody does, but this was beyond the pale. And so, <laughs> He, he goes, we show up there and it was late at night. It was like midnight. And the guy that owned the junkyard was like, usually is, you know, he had, he had a, 
uh, a policy like, you know, for his friends, special friends or favors, you know, I'll open up the junkyard if you really need a part and I'll let you go and rummage through it at night. Now, he gave him a warning. He said, dude, this is a big place and there's snakes and things like that. And this was late spring. So something could happen. And I'm not reliable. If a, if a snake, a rattlesnake bites you, it's on you. So he says, okay. And him being a night owl and him having a very busy schedule at that time, and he was helping his son get his business started during the day. So he said that it was late at night. He goes, let's go get that part. So they went over there and they got the part. They had their flashlights and they were walking around. There were three of them. And, and they, they went and they, they rummaged through the two different vehicles so that they could find the part for this vi- the particular car. Um, they, before they could find the, the t- they found the vehicle, started trying to take the part off. And before they could get it done, they start hearing this noise, which sounded like scrap metal, because of course there's scrap metal everywhere, being tossed around. And it sounded like somebody was throwing it. And like, literally, it sounded like somebody had ripped a car door off of one of these vehicles and tossed it into another vehicle. It was that loud. And then they heard a, this, his words, Bubba's words, and I'll even talk like Bubba and Bubba's cool. He's not going to be mad at me. He knows he's now listening to the show and Bubba, I'm not trying to be, <laughs> we've known each other for a long time, but he says, he says, ah, damn, it sounded like a werewolf on steroids. He was like, he goes, it was like, Arr! and he goes, and it was like, just like that. Like, you know. Did a did like a, a a really good howl impression. He goes and dude, and I hadn't had a lick to drink. He's like, I know every time you see me, I've been drinking, but those are my party nights. And he goes, and that's only you know once every couple of weeks. I tie one on. Last time I saw him, he's up at our Ashes Bar, and he was tying one on. And uh, and so this is when he actually told me this this story right here. And so, and then we talked again on the phone about it, you know, and I didn't have it in time for the book. I wanted to put it in the book and it was something that me and Ken had talked about, but I didn't get around to getting him, uh, to get this story and he just couldn't coordinate. He's a very busy guy. Um, so anyways, he tells me that he hears this how he says, this sounds like something straight out of a movie. And then I thought, Hey, there's somebody out here messing with us. And so he's... It's Texas, dude, okay? And it's Southeast Houston. He's got a gun. Oh, yeah. Um, everybody there is packing. His son, Jake, is not a kid. Um, he's got a gun. You know, he's in his 20s. And so, at that time, you know, Jake was 20s. I think he's in his 30s now because uh, uh, Bubba, I think, is uh, about eight years older than me. So, anyway, he starts telling me all this uh, stuff that was going on that night. He said, dude, right before our eyes... He's like, we see what looks like a green ball of light come zipping around the corner and then just take off real fast. It's always green. Yeah, it's green, right? Isn't yeah. that weird how it's a green? It's always green. If there's something bad, it's always green. It's green well, or orange. Sometimes yeah. it's orange. And, and so the eyes will be orange, right? So then he tells me, he says, dude, I see this ball of light. He goes, and then he's like, we're all just in shock. And he's, and then his, his brother-in-law, who's very superstitious, he says, this place is haunted. And his brother-in-law is half Native American. Like his, his, his dad's uh, full-blooded or, or his uh, mother, full-blooded Native American. And he says, dude, I, I don't want to be in this place. We need to leave. And he says, man, don't be, don't be scared. Let's just, you know, we, you know let's just do what we got to do. Let's get this part and let's get out of here. And so they call Cliff. Cliff's the guy that ran the junkyard at that time. That, that's, I don't know if that's his real name. Um, I didn't ask, but he, uh, he called Cliff and he says, man, do you have a dog here? And he goes, I do, I do, but, but they're with me tonight and you guys are going to be there. And so I took the dogs, you know, home with me and he would stay there sometimes, you know, at at night, you know, and, um, you know, and sometimes he'd go home and he was, he had a, a mobile, like a trailer he would live in. And he said, he wasn't there that night. He said, I knew you guys were going to be there. And I put the dogs up. They're not there. Um, they were Doberman's. And he said that they didn't, you know, that th- there shouldn't be anything there. And he said, well, we just saw like the weirdest thing look like a green ball of light. When he said that, his friend said, you need to get out of there. You need to leave now. You need to get out of there. And he goes, why? He goes, man, whenever something, whenever that, that orb ball of, he didn't call it an orb. I'm calling it an orb. He said, whenever that ball of light shows up, something weird always happens. He said, I had something that looked like, and get this what he described as a Bigfoot type creature come up to his trailer and like break, th- break through the glass, right? 
He doesn't tell him this right then on the spot. He just tells him they need to leave. But later on, he told him, he said a Bigfoot type creature had broke through the glass and, and he described it as a Bigfoot. A big hairy arm was reaching in, trying to, uh, you know, grab whatever, I don't know, to try to get into the trailer. He said, luckily for me, the creature didn't like fit through the window, but he saw its head come through. He had a conical shaped head. And for the description that he gave Bubba and Jake, it did sound like a Sasquatch type Bigfoot type creature, you know, to, and to me. Well, this creature that they saw that night in late spring of 2012, that was, this was not no Sasquatch. Um, very much sounded like what I saw when I was a teenager uh, that's in my book. And what, what's crazy is that they, they, first they catch a glimpse of something running on all fours, but in a weird way, like it ran and the way he said it ran, it was like, it ran really quick. And then it went kind of like behind two cars and his brother-in-law saw it full on and his brother-in-law was like, dude. Something big and hairy just ran between those two cars. And he says, well, Clifford said, we need to get the heck out of here, man, because something weird always happens when we see this ball of light. And he and he's like, but I really want to get this part. I don't care anymore. Let's just get out of here. And there was this is a big place. So he's like, we had to walk out and around kind of like in a maze through this. And he says, and there was this one spot where they had to walk and it was kind of narrow. And when they walked, then they turn around and his son's like, dad, dad. You're going to want to see this. He turns around, he shines the light, and he said there, right before them, you know, about 20 feet behind them was this tall, eight eight foot tall creature with extremely long arms. He said the arms were long, long, like they were hanging down past the knees of this creature, and it had the backward bent hawk-like legs, and he said that this thing was just snarling and growling, and he said you could see saliva dripping off of it, and it was like it looked... That thing looks hungry. And he said the eyes were green. The eyes were glowing green. And he said that it looked like there were some sort of like greenish type vapors coming off the back of it. And he said that it was, the, 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 he's like, Wolf, he's like, I'm going to tell you right now. He goes, we having, you know, hung out at the club and been around downtown. He goes, I've seen some brutal stuff down there. I've seen fights that you got into, fights I got into. Everybody was fighting, doing stuff. He said, nothing scared me like this thing scared me. He's like, and and Bubba was there the night that I got stabbed. So, you know, I remember him being there and he said, dude, this thing was like nothing I'd ever, I, nothing could prepare you for this, right? You know, his brother-in-law was a military vet, you know, was, was you know, just had never seen anything like this, terrified the crap out of him. He said, we were so scared. We all just took off running down that narrow uh, air, like like pathway, and my son cut his arm open real bad. He said that it, he was bleeding, and he said that when, when that happened, it seemed like this creature got more excited because, and this is what they told me, okay? This is what he told me. I didn't talk to his brother-in-law. I only talked to him through email, but when I talked to Jake, Jake said, after I cut my arm, I looked back. He goes, and this thing was not running behind us it was jumping from side to side bouncing like like a pinball like it had gone into overdrive because of you know he goes and i think it was because i cut my arm and he goes my arm was was gushing blood i ended up having to get eight stitches and he said that it was like just bouncing back and forth between these vehicles and then it cr climbed up on top of like two of them and was running along the top like it was trying to kick to cut them off and when they got around the corner, they were able to take off. And but in, unfortunately, they ran in two different directions. He ran in an opposite direction of his dad and his his uncle. And he said that was a huge mistake because this creature jumped down, and it kind of. Uh, he said I watched it. It like observed both directions, and it went straight for me. And he goes and it got down on all fours. He goes I ran. I didn't go for the exit. I saw the fence. He's like, and it had barbed wire on it. I didn't give a crap. He goes, I just jumped, latched onto it. He said, in my whole life, he's like, I am not the most athletic person in the world. He played second string quarterback. He's like, I wasn't real mobile. I could throw the ball, but I was kind of flat footed. He's like, I did my best impression of Spider-Man, dude. He goes, I got up over that wire and I, I, I got hung up on it. And then I fell flat on my face and got a rock cut open the side of my chin, uh, my, uh, my jaw. 
He goes, I didn't feel it. I had a rock embedded in my hand. He's like, I didn't feel none of it. I didn't care that my knees were cut up. I just got up and I was running and my clothes were ripped. And I looked back and this creature had had veered off and was going toward my dad. He goes, at that point, I didn't know what to do. He goes, so I ran and I, I saw like a, a muffler, like a piece of a muffler. And he goes, I just took it and started slamming it against the fence to try to get its attention. He's like, but it wasn't working. It was you know, headed for them. They get around the side of the trailer um, where, where Clifford was kept was stayed, and then they 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 ran and they got to the to the to the gate that was open that that was just kind of dummy locked. They threw the chain off and they ran through it. Well, they got away. They got to their vehicle and they didn't. They looked back. They didn't see this thing anywhere. They didn't see it when they got in their vehicle and they were pulling out. This thing was like ended up like right behind them. And they didn't even know how it happened, but it was like, it was just there. And it like put its weird looking hands. They said it had hands on the back of their car. And then it jumped up and they saw kind of like knees and hands and this via and this thing. And it like head butted the back windshield with its, with its head. And he said that it cracked our back windshield and we just took off, man. We were out of there. He said the next, the next morning he, the, he talked to Clifford and he says, man, you're not going to believe this. We just got attacked by a freaking werewolf. And he said Clifford's exact words were like, huh. Dude, I would, if I were Bubba and his son, I would be so mad. Like, it, it would have been nice to know this in the first place. Well, Clifford said this. He said, I had seen, that's when he told him about the Bigfoot type creature that had attacked after he had seen the orb. He said, but that was like two years before this. So nothing had happened since then. Now he claims that he had seen what he thought was the ghost of someone walking around because this is the truth too, folks. And and now Tony, you and Anthony, remember one of our vehicles for our company got towed, remember? Yeah. And we talked to the people and they, he, they, oh, this gives me the chills. Remember that guy? He was real nice. And he said, go over there to the other side uh, and, and, and go to that fence and tell me if you feel anything. Right now, my hair is standing up on, on, on the end because I walked over there. And he said, those are the vehicles where those were fatalities. People had died in those vehicles. And so when I walked over there, I felt it. I felt this like electric energy and I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. I backed up. I said, oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. I couldn't even. He said, whenever we've given people – you know, the, the, at night, you know, whatever they're, you know, to go out there and kind of walk and they have to walk the grounds or whatever. He said, we've had some break-ins. So we've hired security sporadically here and there. He's like, they always freak out over there. And sometimes they'll say that they see spirits or shadows. Now Clifford told Bubba and his son and, and his, I don't know the other guy's name, um, but I think his name, I think he goes by JJ. He told them, that he had had this Bigfoot experience there, like some kind of Sasquatch or something had attacked. And, th and this is in, you know, in on the outskirts of town, but it's still like, you know, there's civilization around. And he says, he goes, never in a million years had I, would I think that there would be a werewolf in my junkyard, you know, but that wasn't the end. They went back during the day and they got the parts that they needed and they left, right? They, literally found what looked like to them like a paw print, like a giant paw print that was made into the ground. Um, to me, I mean, you can't, you, it looks like a very large wolf-like paw print. Um, you can't really, I don't know, anybody that looks at it is going to say, well, you know. Yeah, I mean, he has Dobermans. So yeah, be he like, has oh, Dobermans, but this was big. I mean, it was big, and they did show a picture of what looked to be the Doberman paw prints as opposed to this thing. But after that, Cliff was pretty uh, uh, frightened, you know, and so he didn't stay there at the junkyard. Um, and he, and so he, he had a, like I said, an RV or a, tra a mobile, whatever. And so he started staying there at his property out in the middle of nowhere. And he said he kept his dogs with him and he didn't keep them there at night. Um, and eventually there was a lot of, stuff happening like vandalism and things like that. And there was a weird thing that happened after that where three kids had broken into his junkyard, I guess just to go in there and vandalize or whatever. And they said that a large dog like creature on the hind legs chased him out of there. 
because they got caught on camera and one of the kids stupidly spray painted his name. <laughs> so they were able to just go and find this kid. So when the Houston police, I guess this is what Clifford said, um, when they talked to him, they were able to identify him and that kid told him that some kind of weird uh, dog-like creature. So Cliff just kind of came to the conclusion that maybe it's just there and it's going to run people off. He doesn't know whether it's full, fully flesh and blood or if it's ethereal. But uh, to the guys that it happened to, it definitely seemed to be like a legit, real flesh and blood thing. But this orb and then the green stuff coming off of its back and whatever else, who knows what that is? I mean, you know, that's just a weird story. Um, I asked Bob, I said, have you ever had anything else happen? Because, you know, a lot of times people have things happen. Here's the weird thing. And one day I'll talk about this. He said that he started after having that particular encounter. He said it was about a week or two after his wife was cooking dinner and she put a pot uh, like of stew on the stove. She set the pot, the the lid on, on the, on the, on the stew and it flew up into the air when she turned her back and hit the ceiling. And then later on, a wooden spoon came flying off of the counter and flew and hit his daughter in the stomach. So they had some weird, like kind of like poltergeist activity that went on at their house where they were living at for like a couple months. And then it kind of died down. Um, and then another time he was driving and he said he was going through Arkansas and he saw something on the side of the road, which was just like a big black shadowy thing that him and his brother <clears throat> and his wife's and his brother's wife saw real quick. And he goes, for, for all I know, it could have been a Bigfoot. I don't know what it was. It was weird though. But all this started after he saw that creature and got chased by it. So I don't know. I mean, if you take that into account, like how people see things and this, you know, this green orb and all that, maybe that's what caused it. Maybe that's what opened it up. I, I have this weird theory that some people think is weird. I think it's correct. But I think when you come in contact with something like this, it you marks know, you. It, it, well, it marks you, opens you up to whatever. You see other things. Yeah. And so uh, that could be what was going on with that particular situation. I don't know. But uh, yeah, there's that story. Um, I just told him, I said, you're lucky to be alive. Yeah. I mean, what else can you say? It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, because, you know, and let's, think, it, let's be honest here. If something were to have happened and they got chewed up, it's going to be a quote unquote dog attack. It's going to be those Dobermans. Yeah. 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 And, and so moving on here, folks, th this, this, this next story, you know, this happened in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, and this was in 1992. And this isn't a real long story, but I thought it was really creepy. And you could literally do an entire show just about these types of beings. I don't know what they are. And Anthony, we talked about this the other day, and Nellie's mother had an experience with something like this. And I'll, ta I'll tell her story after this, but th this is crazy. This guy, he would hear uh, like what sounded like moans and groans and like grunts uh, coming from the upstairs. He bought a house and right after him and he, and he buys a house, him and his wife divorce. And it wasn't even two months, and they bought this house. He sunk all this money into it. Then she's like, you know what? I'm not happy. Goodbye. So she leaves and leaves, takes the kids. So he's living in a four-bedroom house by himself. And at the time, there had been a few things that had happened, but that's not why his wife left. Um, but he said the first time something weird happened, it actually happened in his car. He got in his car, and he was getting ready to leave, and it was Christmas time. And uh, it, it, this was about three months after his wife and children had, had left and moved to Minneapolis. And he said he was backing up and he looked in the rearview mirror and he saw what looked like a, the way he described it, a quote unquote zombie. And, and it, he, he went into a little bit of detail about it. He said that it had just white for its eyes and it looked like its hair was all disheveled and it had its mouth was like a gape. And it was just there for a second, boom, boom, and it was gone. So he freaks out. He slams on the brakes and like literally looks over and his neighbors are standing outside waving at him. And he kind of waves and he's like, did I just see that? Now, everything up to that point, he'd been kind of ignoring. Like 
the bathroom, there would be like the faucet would come on, water would, you know, one day he comes home and uh, there's water all over the kitchen floor. He had a dog and he knew that this couldn't have been the dog urinating on the floor because the dog was trained and it was in a kennel. And there was a big, huge puddle of water that just seemed to come from nowhere. So he he cleaned it up, you know, and and just just dealt with it. But he kept hearing these moans and groans coming from upstairs. And so one day he's watching TV and he hears ah. The, the way he described it, I think I did a pretty good impression of it. It sounded just like that. And then he said, "I heard it again." It was like ah, like that. So he goes up the stairs. And he's like, what am, what am I going to do if I find something? You know, mm-hmm. he's like, I'm scared to death. I'm thinking there's somebody in my house. So he's like, dude, I got a baseball bat, you know, and I start walking up the stairs. He didn't own a gun. And uh, he said, dude, I get to the top of the stairs and I hear, and he said, it sounded like two large chains dropping like one after the other, like, and he was like, what in the heck is that? So unless there's a Decepticon in my in one of my spare bedrooms, who's doing construction? Yeah, who's God. over here throwing chains around? You know, and so because he, he's like, dude, what what could cause that? So he goes into the 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 area where he hears the sound. The door is partway open, and he sees like a like quick shadow move behind the door, and he goes, "Oh no, there really is somebody in there." He says he takes the bat and he's just about to poke the door and the door starts to open by itself. And in the middle of the room, he sees what looks like a flickering, vibrating, bluish green like entity. That's the only way he could describe it. He goes, I couldn't really make out what it was. It was like blink, 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 and it was gone. And he goes, but it almost looked like, like kind of like what I'd seen in the back of my car when I was going to work, Right. And so he backs up and he's like, dude, you know, he's like, it was like cold as heck, you know, and he goes, dude, the upstairs, you know, was, was freezing cold, but he goes, but that particular room was more cold. Like it was colder than the rest of the house. And he said, dude, being there and standing there, he goes, just my elbow being inside of the doorway literally froze that part of my arm. And I told him, I said once, and if you go back to the archives of my show, folks, and go and listen to an episode called The Restless Widow, where something touched my arm. And I said, did it feel like a shock of cold? He goes, yeah. It's like it emanated up my bicep, my tricep, up into my shoulder, and then across my forearm into my hand to the point where I couldn't even hold the bat. I put it down, and I just ran down the stairs. He said a couple days later, he had some people come over uh, because he had a, he had a uh, electrical issue. The thing kept tripping or whatever. And so he had an electrician come and look at it. Electrician's like, everything's fine. It's a friend of his. And he said, I don't know what's going on. He says, so we crack a couple beers. We start talking or whatever. And while we're talking, my friend Chris is there. And he says, "I we hear that uh, like noise again. And he goes, dude, what the heck was that? And he said, they were getting ready to hang out and actually watch uh, some football. It was the playoffs, whatever. And so he said, you know, we're sitting there and we're getting ready to Watched a football game. He's like, and so my friend, our other friend comes over. He shows up right at the same time as we, like right after we hear that noise. So we just kind of blew it off and just ignored it. The friend comes over, rings the doorbell. We let him in. He's got some beer. We all just kind of hang out. We ordered some pizza and we're sitting there talking and and he's right at our kitchen, my kitchen table. And, uh, one of my friends flips a bottle cap. He goes, when the bottle cap hits the table, it flies way up into the air, like three or four feet, like unnaturally. He goes, and when it does, he looks up and he, we, we all see this as like a wet spot above the, the, the table. And, and he's like, and you could just see, then all of a sudden water starts dripping and they're like, oh no, something's leaking. So they all run up the stairs and when they run up the stairs, They hear the of the chains moving around and all three of them are, they kind of spread out and his one friend comes this ashen white face, um, the the third guy that showed up and he says, dude, I got to get out of this house. I got, I have, I have to get out of this house. So his other friend, Chris, the electrician says, well, the electric, the thing obviously tripped again because the electricity is off in these two rooms. And he says, don't, and the other guy who I can't remember his name, but he told him, he says, don't go in that room. There's something in there. 
He's like, I saw something crawling around on the floor. He didn't say someone. He said something. So he takes off and he runs down the stairs and he's gone. He leaves everything, including his wallet, his keys, and he runs out of the house. And then he comes back in and he says, he knocks on the door. He refuses to go back in. He says, I I left my keys. And he's like, okay. And he's like, he's like, dude, I don't know what to tell you, man. He goes, you need to call an exorcist. I don't know. And his friend takes off. He just leaves. And then once again, he left his wallet. So, he, so the next day, the, there weren't cell phones. Like everybody didn't have a cell phone back then. So he calls his friend and he says, look, he's like, you left your wallet. He goes, I don't care. Just drop it off at the, you know, at, at work or whatever. They're work friends. He said, I'll see you o- o- on Monday. Refused to talk about it. Did not want to talk about it. Was like, I don't care. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to talk about it. We're good. You know, keep the money. I don't give a crap. He was terrified. So then his friend, Chris, who was a little intrigued, he knew a woman who was a psychic. So she decides to come over and vi- t- pay a visit and, and, and go into the house. She gets about six feet into the house and she says, you got some a really, really bad restless spirit here. She's like, and this person, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a human spirit that is trapped here and it is tormented. And she said that something really bad happened. And then just then she starts feeling like something's choking her, like that she can't breathe. So then she just walks out, takes off and says, I'm good. I don't, I don't want to deal with this. She's like, if you want to talk about it, we can meet somewhere else because you have a serious problem in your house and there's nothing I can do because the spirit doesn't want to communicate. Right? So then he figures out he's in trouble. He's like, I got to get out of this freaking house. There's something wrong here. Very bad wrong. I got to get out of here. And so what ends up happening, he's walking into his kitchen and he sees, and this is really messed up. He sees this man crawling around on the floor, wrapped in chains, Mm. literally dragging chains behind him. And he looks like he's dripping wet. Like there's water dripping off of this guy. And he looks over and all his eyes are bulging out of his head and they're white. Like he's drowned. Like he had been drowned. Like yes. Tossed and his lake. tongue was like hanging out. It was a terrifying thing. Folks, if you have children, please don't be letting them listen to this. And he says, dude, I backed up. And he goes, and I literally let loose. I urinated myself. He's like, dude, I got out of that house so fast. He's like, and, and I never went, I never went back. He goes, I hired some movers. He said, and I put it on the market. He's like, and maybe it was wrong. Maybe it's bad karma. I don't know, but I sold him the house, said that the house is fine, whatever. And he took well below market for the house and he moved the heck out. And he was living at, at first, he was living in a motel. Then he rented an apartment and he, cause he was having restless nights. He couldn't, he was having dreams that some guy was walking around in his house and doing, it was just crazy. A bunch of stuff went on, you know, beyond that. He hasn't told me everything, but that's the, the main gist of it. And he was gone. Now, here's a, here's, here's a crazy story that, that Nellie's mother had happened to her. And I don't know the whole story, but when she was a child, I don't know the, the whole story of the house that she lived in, but she saw someone crawling around in the hallway going from one room into the next. And this was the same thing. This person was dragging, they, they, were, they were chained, and they were dragging the chains behind them. And, but it wasn't the same where it looked like the guy was wet or drowned or anything like that. But that story was, was very scary. I always thought that that was terrifying. And the description of the guy was like, he looked like he was tormented. So me and Nellie had talked about this and thought maybe this guy, like maybe it's some sort of, you know, karmic debt that goes on into the afterlife. I don't know. But can you imagine see, and now uh, seeing something like that? Here's the thing, folks. I actually went into my archives and I found a few in- accounts of, of ghosts wrapped in chains. Uh, one happened off the coast of Thailand. Um, and it was, a fr- well, you know, my friends, there's some friends of mine that did that, that kickbox over there. And I've, we've had several. And one that had a school. And this is not a real long story either. Um, but, uh, you know what? I'll save that one for the live stream, folks. If you want to hear that one, go to the live stream. I'll tell that one on the live stream. But anyway, that one involves a spirit very similar. At least I don't know if it, I don't know if it's a spirit. I don't know what it is, but we can talk about that on the live stream. Do you think, we'll move forward on this. Do you think that maybe it is like the more hatred you have, the more it binds you kind of thing? 
something weights you down. Like yeah. um, people say that whenever they have near the exp- experiences, near death experiences, that one of the main things, that the main themes is that they don't forgive. They can't forgive and they can't let go and they have hate in their heart for people. And when that happens, they're told you can't, you know, move on because of this. And sometimes people will have hell-like experience. That's for another show. But, yeah, I think that that is something that could be weighting you down and you could end up, you know, wrapped in chains. I, I don't know. Yeah, it was definitely weird. It's definitely something that makes you take a pause. Um, and it's it's – I don't know if people will have seen the last show, but we talked about uh, spirits moving in a different time table than us. Last week's episode. Last week's episode. Yeah. I'm curious about like what his, that tormented experience would be like if you have no real understanding of time, like how we would to where it's very linear for us. But for them, it might be like a giant circle, a square, a triangle. Like, we have no idea how that, thing perceives its own torment so that could be why it's suffering so horribly to a point to where it's like i can't help it because it doesn't want help it does not asking for help it's just it doesn't even it's know so where much, it's so at much, yeah yeah it's, it's like it, it's so tormented it's just it's like in a level of hell or something yeah, yeah it's very terrifying maybe it's not even capable of comprehending, uh, comprehending of, of, of yeah. asking for or not not just asking for but even just accepting help mm-hmm I, when you first told the story, I thought it was just, you know, one of the ghosts trying to be one of the boys and was just <laughs> playing the bottle flip game too and was just too good at it, but. Well, I was going to make a joke about about it being Boris Karloff up in his attic, but <laughs> I'm kind of glad I didn't because the, the, the story is actually very sad. Yeah. I mean, who knows what that is or why that is. Mm-hmm. We just know that it that it is. I mean, it's it's weird. But um, here here's another one I was going to tell you. This happened in South Dakota, and and it's I don't have a lot of these. I was on the phone with Barton a couple weeks ago, and we were talking about bat squatch. And Barton, folks, has an incredible story that that his neighbor, that only lives you know like six miles from him, told him. But that's his story, and when he's ready to tell it and ready to to whatever, then he'll he'll have it on his channel, or he can come on and talk about it on this channel. Uh, Barton Nunley, the author, he's a good friend of mine. So, folks, you know. Stay tuned for that one if he hasn't already told it, but it's a bat squatch. So I, I told him, I said, I only have maybe three or four bat squatch stories. Now, bat squatch to me, from what I can gather, is this creature that has like these bat like wings, but it's a Bigfoot. But it's weird because most of the stories you have about bat squatch, people don't actually see it flapping the wings. It's kind of just zooming around. It's like the wings are just there, like gliding. Um, yeah, sort of, but not, but it's kind of just moving really fast. Gliding. Like moving is as, as if its wings would be flapping, but they're not. They're right? not. Yeah. Let's okay. put it that way. And Anthony knows what I'm talking about. Um, w- whenever th- this, this happened, this was in South Dakota and these people were driving through, I guess what would be called the Black Hills area of South Dakota. Um, I'm not real familiar with like, uh, the terrain and all that because I don't, I don't, South Dakota is just like, uh. It's such a small, uh, sparsely populated state. We don't get like a whole lot of stories from there, um, but you do get them. Now, here's what's weird. I did get a story. Now, when I looked into it, there was another story from South Dakota in the Black Hills, um, but it involved like two really, really evil, like gnome-like creatures. And that's not for that's for another show. But remind me, I'll tell it on the live stream. Anyway. I, 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 this bat squatch story I got out of the Black Hills, of South Dakota. The people were driving through there, and they see this creature. What looks like to, like it's flying, or I guess this would be gliding, um, and it's holding what looks like a giant rock, a very jagged like rock. And they're driving along, uh, and this happened in 2007. And and this thing just drives or just flies over their vehicle, over their SUV. And it drops this big rock right in front of their vehicle. And the description of it was this giant, like, pointy-headed, what looks, I mean, just like a like a Bigfoot. Like, it just sounded like a Bigfoot. Um, the face looked kind of like Neanderthalic or Cro-Magnon. This is their words. Mixed with, like, ape-like. But it had really big, sharp canines. 
and it kind of had a short, short muzzle and it didn't have the, the, uh, backward bent legs like a dog man or the ears. It was very much squatch like, but it had these big round red eyes and it had what looked like bat like wings that were folding and then closing, but they weren't flapping, which is kind of weird. And so whenever it flew in front of their vehicle, it was about 15 feet right in front of them and it dropped this big rock. So they swerved. And this is in the middle of the, this is the middle of the uh, daytime, like broad daylight, whatever. They swerved and narrowly missing this vehicle or narrowly, narrowly missing their vehicle. And it was close to dusk. And when they did, the side of their tire gets cut. So then <laughs> they end up on the side of the road knowing that this creature is there somewhere so they sit there for about 10 minutes and they're like you know what maybe we should call triple a or something they don't have triple a he's like we're out in the middle of nowhere and usually there's some vehicles you know driving around on that road nobody's driving around here's what's even weirder when they looked at the sky the sky had this purplish haze to it like, it's weird. It wasn't like a normal, like, blue sky. And, and of course, colors are all, you know, relative, too, depending on the person. But three people in a vehicle, a dad, his son, and his wife, and they're all seeing this purplish looking, like, the, the color of the sky. And his the, the, the dad, his name's Mark. Mark gets out of the vehicle because his wife's like, no, stay in the vehicle, stay in the vehicle. He's like, we have to change this tire. We can't sit here. She's like, did you not just see... The creature that just flew over, it was like seven foot long and it was probably three feet wide. It was, she's like, it was a giant with wings and fur. And he's like, well, I can't help that. You know, I have to change this tire. We don't have anybody that's going to come rescue us. I can't get a signal. Right. So he's like, I have to do what I have to do. So his son, who's 14, brave kid, he gets out. He's like, I'm going to help my dad. I'm going to, we're going to do this. The mom is hysterical. She's freaking out, trying to get a signal, can't get a signal. They start to change the tire. When they do, they look over and he's like, Dad, look. And then he turns, he looks and he sees it standing and he hear, he sees the wings kind of open and close a couple times and then go behind his back. And he's sitting there looking at this creature and he said that it was kind of fat looking. Like he, it, like chubby, like he's like, it was a chunky looking kind of fat furry creature. And he was like, how is this thing able to fly? You know, he goes, the wings didn't look like it was big enough to, to it was like six, 700 pound creature. Like how are those wings making that thing fly? It didn't make sense to him. And then he's like, no vehicles are around. And then he notices that the road that they were on looked like it was all cracked and like it was messed up, like it was old and decayed or something. And he's like, where are we? And then he, it hit him. He's like, he goes for a minute there. He goes, I don't think we were in the normal world. He's like, it was. And, and I said, thinking that the road was still there with the yellow stripe on it and everything else, but it looked all cracked and like it had been taken care of and it looked like it was falling apart. I was like, what do you think you were? And he, I said, the future, the past, an alternate reality, another dimension. He goes, I don't know. He's like, but I felt like it was an alternate reality, but like in the future. And he said, and this creature started to walk towards us and we were sitting there uh, at that point, putting the tire, the tire on and I'm doing the best I can trying to get the spare. He says, at that point, it's like everything shifted. Like, it was weird. It was like, he goes, I kind of got lightheaded, and so did my son. And later, his wife told him, too, that she did, too. And then he says, all of a sudden, we see a semi drive by. And he's like, I've never been so happy to see a truck that drove so close to us. It almost killed us. He's like, but I was actually happy. He goes, and then I look, and the road looks normal, and the creature is gone. And he's like, and then we get back on the road and we don't see hide nor hair of this thing again. Like it was gone. There was nothing else. I mean, nothing else happened. Uh, they got to a hotel, uh, you know, a couple hours later where they were headed. And then, and he's very, um, I don't know how you say it. Like he did, he didn't, I asked him, uh, you know, about any other encounters he had. And I, and I met him from somebody in one of the groups that actually said, Hey, this guy's got a story. He didn't seem very forthcoming, like he wanted to talk about some of the other experiences. He just kept saying, well, they're really strange. They're really weird. 
you know, and, and, and you might not believe me. And I kept encouraging him. I told him, I said, look, dude, if something else happened, tell me. I mean, look, I'm all ears, dude. It's all relative. Yeah. And he kept saying, well, it's just some of the weird stuff that happened after that. It was just really weird, you know, and he just kind of was vague and didn't give me like a whole lot of other information. He told me that this creature was a brownish black and it had like kind of a gray on, on the on the front of its chest. Um, I don't know if that meant like it was an older creature. I don't know. I don't know if this thing was physical, metaphysical or what it was. But this thing obviously had a plan if it's dropping a small boulder in front of your car to make you wreck. And who knows if that's even like, and this is going to sound weird, folks, to people who are uninitiated, but those that are initiated who listen to the show, it's almost like this thing was like, like, I don't know, like if somebody, if, if, if let's just say for argument's sake, we're living in some sort of matrix. It's like somebody made that happen. Like, you know, it, it, it drops something, makes you go off the road and just happens to pop your tire. Right. And then you kind of fall off into this weird sort of alternate reality. I don't know what that was. Everything looks different and weird. You know, the colors were off. And then this creature's there. And then all of a sudden, reality comes back. It's almost like somebody was messing. If somebody was to mess with you yeah. and create this creature. And the only reason I thought that wasn't, was, wasn't because of the alternate reality thing, because we've heard of this before, but... A couple of the other accounts I got of these bat squatch creatures d do involve, and I will eventually get to them, but they do involve like kind of things being not the way they should be. Does it? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And what, 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 here's another, just another theory. But what I find, what could, we might be giving more credit to these creatures than than they really should have. It might be that. They have no control over the portals or over how they get over into this world. It might just be like something entirely random to where like, let's say in an alternate dimension, there's just flying creatures. There's just dog man running around and Bigfoot running around and then randomly a portal opens up and then they get sucked into it or they walk into it. Oh, so they might just be just as confused as we are. Yeah. And then like the ones that are here and the, they're already accustomed to it. They're like, yeah, we made it over here. And like, we already know how it all works over here. But like some of the new ones, like that one that just flew in, it might just been like he, he entered that portal. Like the, the creature entered the portal first and was like shocked and, and entered our world. And then when he dropped the rock, like the portal or like he went back into their world for a second, but because we're physical beings, we can't exist in their world. So we just automatically get like shot back into ours, but it might've just been something to where like it entered our world for a second. And then they both entered that thing's world and then suddenly came back. I think I fought. <laughs> you understand I what I'm trying to say? say? He's saying that, that, that this creature somehow stepped through a portal and it entered our world. And then somehow the creature and the people who saw it ended up back in, in this creature's world. And then the people somehow ended up back in our world again. Yeah. But like, it's not like they, the creatures themselves have like control over how they enter our world or anything like that. It might just be like some kind of random happenstance to yeah. where it could be like something that just magically happens that, that it shocks them just as much as us. So then that, that's like when it showed up in our world, it was just confused. And when we, we showed up in their world, it was just, it was just confused. So it was just trying to like, it went to them to like attack them because it didn't know any better because it might not have as much mental faculties as we're giving it, you know? Well, and, here's a weird thing. And I'll talk about this on the live stream too. I got two, two encounters of flying humanoids. Now they weren't bat squatch. They were just flying humanoids with different appearances. But one of them happened in San Diego, and one of them happened in Tijuana, and they were only two weeks apart, making me think that maybe that's the same creature. It, 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 it didn't look vampiric, and it didn't look like a bat squatch, okay? But it did have horns. Now, it had like these curved kind of ram-like horns, and they were two different people. And, and the reason I know is because – the first person gave it to me from San Diego, and he said that his roommate's cousin had seen something very similar to that two weeks later in, in Tijuana because, you know, Tijuana is right there on the border. 
And so the close proximity makes me think that there's something to it. Both of these encounters involve this ram-headed looking creature that by all rights shouldn't be able to fly around and do what it does because it was huge. But the similar descriptions, and I'm not going to get into descriptions of everything. I'll talk about it on the live stream. But I want to say that it, that that particular creature came out of a portal and only because there was like this mist. Now, like we were talking about the green mist. The one in San Diego that the guy saw, his name's Kenny, or not Kenny, uh, uh, Jerry. He sent me this story. He said that it looked like it came out of this weird shimmering kind of green mist that that appeared over his vehicle. And he said that he was going pretty fast. I mean, he was in a sports car and he was hauling. And he said, dude, I was definitely breaking the law. (laughs) I was going fast. And he goes, and this thing just came out of nowhere with this green kind of gas. We said gas. I say mist. And then I kind of, I I didn't want to lead him, but I said, did it look kind of like a mist? He said, yeah. He said that the thing was like just flying along his vehicle and going like pretty fast. And then he said, when I told my roommate about it, my roommate said, dude, you know, my cousin, she saw something similar to that in Tijuana. And she lives across the border. He said, so one day. Uh, they meet up in San Diego and they go eat dinner and she tells him the story. So he gave me the story that she had given him and uh, it was very similar and we'll get into it. But the difference was that there was like a sort of a silvery white shimmering mist around that creature. And it seemed like, like she said that the creature, when it first came into, into our reality and, and like I said, I'll get into details on the live stream. It was almost like it would like time slowed down. So they're, you know, really weird stories. And there's more to Jerry's story too. This thing didn't just show up and fly along. It did some stuff. But uh, like I said, we'll talk about that on the live stream. I, I, I want to say that all of these creatures probably have something weird. If people would just pay attention, you know, um, there was a Bigfoot story I got out of uh, Sam Houston uh, Forest, um, uh, you know, and and I, th- it was like a twelve foot tall Bigfoot, but the way it, it it was when it was walking, the guy said it looked blurry and that it was kind of distorted and moving back and forth, like if you took a piece of plexiglass in the sun and was like like moving it around, you know, and then it just kind of came into focus. And then it went and hid behind a tree. And now you you guys know <laughs> that I got into an argument in a Bigfoot group because a guy said that a Bigfoot, what he says, like a nine foot tall Bigfoot went and hid behind a cactus, right? Yeah. And I, I was like, really, dude? Like, you know, like, I mean, like, because I said, well, it sounds like it was something spiritual. And he goes, well, I don't think it was spiritual. I think it was cloaking. And I said, really, dude? Like, that's, you know, and there again, there was... In that same area, when he talked to a particular uh, person that I don't remember the whole story, like I just, it was in one of the groups and that person said that they had seen what looked like a circle in the middle of nowhere in broad daylight. And when they looked through the circle, this was a deserty area, right? Where they were at. When they looked through the circle, there was like a forest and like a whole world, you know? Now they didn't see the Sasquatch, but- this guy sees a Sasquatch two months later, same area. You this know, guy sees a portal. Yeah. yeah, I mean, hello. I'm not. I'm not trying to say that that's because you. You know, we don't know for sure because it's two different things. But I would say, I mean, if you if you're a betting man, you'd bet that that's, that's where it's coming from. Yeah. And of course, when I mentioned that, then I'm I'm the dummy. But anyways, folks, we all know that I'm the dummy. Uh, well, well, one thing I find interesting about cloaking, I mean, we've been talking about this topic for the past couple of weeks, but light, you know, light, the way we perceive light is so interesting. It could just be that what we consider cloaking might just be that they turn into colors we can't perceive. Yeah. Just simple as that. Like, it doesn't have to be perce- some our perception, like, our, yeah. our visual perception. Because it's not like they disappear truly. I mean, sometimes they don't. Like, um, I mean, even in, in the uh, Bigfoot phenomenon book, there's uh, during Claudia's story, she, they're invisible, but they're still there. They're like, they're interacting with her in some sort of way. Like she was definitely feeling that. So it could just be that 
instead of them like actually just turning invisible or something like that, it could just be that they are, we can't perceive them because of the way we perceive light. And it's an easy way to, you know, cause I don't, I don't know when people say like cloaking and stuff like that, it, it just feels weird to me. It feels like they're like hide, putting themselves in a veil or something or, or doing something magical when it could just be something very simple. And I think, I feel like a lot of this is just simple things that we don't understand. So it seems magical to us. Yeah. Well, either way, they're not, I mean, these particular creatures are not fully physical. No. Uh, something's no. going on here, and I think these people are seeing something, what I don't know. Uh, but, folks, thank you for tuning in tonight. Uh, Paranormal Roundtable, do you got any closing things to say, Anthony? Tony said his. I kind of just want to agree with Tony. I mean, because cloaking is, at least we do actually understand it to an extent in the sense that it's a matter of just bending light rays the, the right way. Because, and uh, I've said this before on the past in the show, that uh, we, we we actually have a form of cloaking right now where we can put an object in, in water. Granted, it has to be a small object. And it will actually disappear in that water if like the... the uh, Light rays are are bent in a very specific way around it. Like, like you'll and you can see videos of it. You'll see it. And you'll just like see it disappear, and you'll see right through it. And in this in this clear like cube of water, it looks like there's nothing. I believe it was like a university experiment or something, but I, I've I've seen it before, and it, it's it's not. It's more of a matter of science. But like Tony said, if if something. If something is scientific and we don't understand it, we call it magic or unexplainable or paranormal. But paranormal is just a science waiting to be explained. We've said that before. Yep. Like like they talk about brujeria, you know, is black magic. It's, you know, it's black science. Yeah. yeah. Folks, that, that's all the time we have for tonight. Thank you for tuning in. Don't forget the conference is coming up. It's it's almost here. And uh, be there. Be square. Go to go to Fort Worth. and mm -hmm. And... I was going to say, second reminder, we don't, we're not going to have shows on Friday, Sunday. So just be prepared for that and don't be angry at us if you're waiting there for hours and we're not showing up. Should have been at the conference. <laughs> yep. 29th. Yeah. It, it, today would be the 29th. And so the conference is literally in just like two more days. Um, and so we'll be there and we're going to be streaming it, hopefully. Uh, if it all worked out, then right now while I'm talking, um, I'm telling, telling you what's going to happen. Thank you, folks, for tuning in. We appreciate everybody who showed up uh, to listen to the show tonight. And if you're not listening to the live stream, go check it out because that's where I'm going to do a lot of this storytelling. So I'll see you guys. Peace. Peace.